And so I'm really excited to introduce Scott. Dr. Scott Pearl is a research scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, specializing in life in extreme environments and their survival, preservation, and within the mineral and rock record. Dr. Pearl is also the co-principal investigator of the JPL Origins and Habitability Lab. Alongside JPL, Dr. Pearl is a research affiliate in the mineral sciences at the Los Angeles Natural History Museum Museum and an astrobiologist with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. So Scott, take it away. Come tell us all, everything you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you for everyone for, for this whole setup. And it's, it's, re it's really awesome in terms of, of, of all the events tonight and all the, all the speakers. So I will share my screen and we'll go through uh, some of the slides. And so um, I want to start off in terms of the first real data set that I was able to work with um, when I was in college. And so um, this is back in 2005 and there's a running joke and I'll, I'll, I'll make my screen full screen after this, but um, can everyone see my screen just to make sure? Yeah, you're good. So uh, back in early 2005 um, within the Burns formation on Mars, prior to the Mer rovers, these are the Mars exploration rovers, um, we had saw um, in terms of just large scale orbital data um, that there might have been channels and deltas and essentially old signs of water that essentially traverse through certain features of Mars. Um, but in terms of the actual timeliness and how, how long water actually interacted with the Martian regolith uh, was, was, was still to be determined. And so when it came down to understanding um, essentially water rock and water mineral relationships, uh, it was this outcrop that we saw in early 2005, and, and you can see from the backdrop uh, that we're still on the actual rover landing pad, and so we hadn't left yet, and this was the first assessment. This was the very first panoramic image. Um, you can see off in the distance um, these somewhat protruding outcrops, uh, and these are, are essentially part of the regolith that's present on, on, in this crater. If you were to zoom in on any, or at least kind of see your eye on these kind of elongated bedding planes along the actual outcrop, more so in this part on the right, when you zoom in on those areas, you see features uh, that look very similar to, or at least this is actually the, the actual image you see when you zoom in uh, um, on, on that right side of the image. And so uh, my first assignment as an undergrad essentially was to piece this together. And so this is showing rounded grains that are laminated in this large cement. And so when you think of water coming down a stream, you essentially have rounded, you know, rounded pebbles and rocks are able to skip along the water. This is equivalent to that in terms of the groundwater that essentially permeated through the surface. Now we usually land a crater, Jezero crater in the next um, 20 plus days. We usually land in craters uh, because it gives us a natural dig site in terms of the actual sedimentology uh, of the rocks and minerals that are present. And so what you're looking at here from, from the bottom up, if you will, uh, is going essentially deep in geologic time. And so the timing that, that the waters are present on Mars, as, as Bonnie mentioned about three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, that timing is constrained relative to the water rock and water mineral interactions that are present um, where we can relatively date these same features. And so if you have minerals and rocks that are modified by water and those, and those minerals and rocks can be dated, you also date the water that's present that modified them. And so um, what you're looking at here is essentially um, the rise and fall of a groundwater table, of a, of a long scale um, actual groundwater table uh, that was dormant uh, um, and essentially static in these in these rounded um, or in these bedded plains. Now, if you remember back, you know, now 16 years ago, there were the Martian blueberries, which are these features that are here. These are hematite creations. Um, the main reason why we landed at this site was was an iron oxide called hematite. It's 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 iron two and three parts oxygen um, that that's found Earth with standing bodies of water and hot springs. And so this was found with a thermal emission spectrometer um, that was on board a Martian orbiter uh, about four years earlier. So when we think about water on Mars, we we immediately go to habitability. And so when it comes down to understanding. If, if a planet was actually habitable, you have your global extremes when it comes down to which parts are more or less habitable relative to one another. But if you have a planet that is habitable, it doesn't mean that actually it is fully inhabited. And so 
in terms of life detection versus habitability measurements, those are completely different things. And so we tend to have these alongside water because as a solvent, uh, water is a, uni or is, is a very good universal um, solvent to have life within its own natural Petri dish. And so you can think about features in terms of Europa and Enceladus, for example, certain moons in our solar system that have deep kind of ocean ice interfaces with, with, a, with a large scale ocean underneath that has present water right now. On Mars on the surface, however, these are features that uh, um, you, you've lost all the water over geologic time. And so when it comes down to the Martian time scales and so forth, um, if you're looking for extant life that's present on Mars right now, it needs to have some kind of solvent in order to actually fully go about its nutrient processes and also metabolic processes, nutrient cycling. So these are features that you would need to have some sort of, essentially in this case, kind of deep subsurface water, potentially an aquifer on Mars where the water is away from the from the dangerous UVC that's actually permeating through the surface. Um, as was was mentioned earlier, when 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 Mars lost its full atmosphere, um, the 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 full destructive power of UVC made its way through the atmosphere to essentially sterilize the whole surface. And so um, when we have these features, uh, when you, in terms of, of the Mars Exploration Rover and also NSL, that was designed to look for habitable environments, more so MSL than MER. The Mars 2020 rover is taking the next step in that with regard to looking for if these environments that we've deemed are habitable, what's the potential for life to, to, to have been left behind? And then as, as was mentioned before, ancient biosignatures from life that's long gone versus extant life that's present now, you have your series of questions that, that there is some overlap between what you'd be looking for, but the search for extant life and present life is only just getting started. We had a workshop last year, it was the first workshop of, of its kind to look at Mars extant life. And there's a paper that we have out now, I guess earlier in uh, last year, uh, that's the summary of that conference. And so an update to this habitability metric is it was just accepted in terms of astrobiology. Um, so, so that will be out soon. So when we're so now in terms of Gale Crater, for example, what you're looking at here, um, this is where we landed in 2012. This is with the MSL rover. You're essentially kind of sitting in a in a in a former lake bed that that's all fully dried up. And so, um, for the untrained eye, or at least to look at these features, you can see with my mouse. Here are these essentially layered bed crop features that that when you zoom in, and I'll go into the next slide, you can see rounded spherical rocks and minerals that, that essentially have been physically weathered by the lake bed waters that, was one, that, that were once here. And so again, this is about 3.5 to 3.8 billion years ago. So the presence of the minerals that are relatively dated to that time scale means that the waters that were present had to have been that old. And so um, that's, a, that's a very neat feature because Mars doesn't have plate tectonics. So when you have features, so the entire planet is one basaltic plate, if you will, they're, they're in terms of oceans, those don't exist. And so you have these, these, these rivers and streams and deltaic features. All of Jezero Crater is actually a giant, or at least most of Jezero Crater is actually a giant delta that I'll show in a few slides. Um, but, but the actual fluid movement in this case, if life was present in here, it essentially precipitated the minerals that have formed as those waters dried up, you would see features like this. And so this is zooming in, this is the left side of the rover. And so these, these large scale microstructures um, are, are what was left behind from a former lake bed. And so it's important to note that if I was to do a Mars sample return mission, which, which, you know, thankfully there's one coming up in the next three weeks, where in this work volume would I choose samples to bring back to Earth and why, right? So these are questions that we have to have when it comes down to, well, why is this spot better than this spot? And better is relative to, uh, I was just assuming, uh, and, and, and that, and then taking measurements to see what's actually present there. And so what are the instruments that we would need in terms of a Martian field site to be able to understand, well, this, this, this has a certain metric that's higher than this and whatever this would be, um, why would we bring that back? And so we have, a, we have um, I believe 20, 26 sample caches. I think it, it's um, uh, in terms of spanning the entire primary mission. Um, and so we have to be selective about what we choose. So in terms of looking at this globally, and I'll, I'll kind of go into what these are, on the left side, this is, this is essentially two, two different rover missions on one slide. But on the left side, you have these salt minerals that were essentially dug up via a trench from the Spirit rover. This is going back to 2005, 2006. Um, and this is on the other side of the planet from, from what I just showed in terms of Gale Creator. So there's, 
so there was a wheel that was not working um, throughout the majority, or I guess throughout the, the, the whole mission for the Spirit Rover. And it was dragging behind Regolith as it was driving forward. Thankfully, there were six wheels and there were power, or five working wheels. And, and, and that was powerful enough to, uh, to actually dig a trench as we were going forward, depending on where we were going direction wise. So in terms of looking back at the trench, we noticed very early on high contents of silica as well as the these hydrated salt minerals that were embedded uh, in the Martian regolith. And so this is this is just on like the like the shallowest part of the subsurface where if you can dig your hand and move some of the regolith aside, you'd, you'd actually see this. So this tells us that the groundwater table permeated up potentially through the surface. Um, and we see with the Martian blueberries that these features um, as as those waters uh, froze and evaporated potentially at the same time to yield what those iron um, how those hematite spherules were, uh, this is water that, that percolated through the surface and then breached the surface. And you can see this in terms of what hasn't been oxidized yet. This is just below the, the actual shallow subsurface. And so when you look at a certain global perspective of Mars, all the icons, and I have a, a larger picture of this in a few slides, um, all, the, all the actual colored icons that you see on the right side are all minerals that have been hydrated or essentially modified by fluids. So you have this really nice pattern here between the northern lowlands and southern highlands of where these fluids actually were. So if you were to send a rover mission to a crater, you best believe that we would actually pick a site that, that has a huge majority of these icons. And so it makes sense given the natural field site that's there, but the point of it being that the timing of the fluids and what the mineral kinetics, so these are all different mineral suites. It's, it's, you know, it's, not, it's not a surprise that you have clusters of certain minerals that correspond to a certain set of kinetics of volumes of water that would actually precipitate once they're evaporated to actually form what those minerals are. And that's important to keep in mind because kinetics here on Earth and Mars are the same. So we use that for timing and it's very important. So Jezero Crater, for example, when you're looking just kind of zoomed in now in terms of, of these hydrated minerals, um, the colors on the left show what these minerals are. And so each of these seven mineral suites that you see on the left here, that corresponds to a certain set of mineral kinetics and hydrated states where if we're able to actually tease out and pick out what these minerals are compared to our relative libraries, we can get timing of those fluids. Now, in, in, this, in this deltaic region, this is Jezero Crater zoomed in um, uh, in terms of where the landing site would be near. Uh, we have features that that correspond to those colors. So you see a trend here, just like the trend globally, where you have clusters of those minerals. That same trend occurs here in terms of these deltaic regions. And so clays and the actual volume of water it takes to, to contribute and form to, and, and actually form a clay corresponds here to the volumes that you'd see in terms of where in this landing site we would be. And so great. So like for example, is, is your kind of rewind in terms of Jezero Crater where you still have water present. And so what's happening here on the shoreline and, and as Bonnie and, and as folks mentioned, uh, within the actual spiral jetty, you have the constant moving of those waters and precipitation of these minerals. Now, when it comes down to, to, to the work that we've been doing there, um, as you're going through and getting gypsum as well as halite, you have different preservation metrics when it comes down to what you can see in terms of the carotenoid biomarkers. And so that's what makes these actual pigments pink. There's an element of photobiology where the actual halophiles are corresponding to UV A and B with it that's, that's being subjected to the salt terraces that are there. And they're producing these actual carotenoids to actually filter and fight against UV radiation. Now on Mars, when it comes down to UVC versus Earth's UV A and B, what would these features look like in terms of Jezero Crater? And so this has yielded um, a, a, a slew of results for work that Bonnie and I have started and then spinoffs um, over the last seven years. And so I'll go into some of those now. Um, we have a paper that is in revision right now that actually examines these same carotenoids, but hopefully the video is clear, is, is actually showing in terms of uh, the actual cell motility, um, but as done in previous studies as, as well as our, our most recent paper, the halophiles that are entombed, essentially zooming into a fluid inclusion that's within a salt crystal, essentially. Um, uh, the same kind of salt crystal that Bonnie showed um, um, in, on her video. Uh, you have these, these, these extremely massive halophilic microorganisms in terms of the biomass and actual biology that's present here. You can see them modal inside a fluid inclusion. Now, we use Raman spectroscopy to essentially vibrate the atoms of both the carotenoid pigments 
the actual cells themselves and the minerals that are, that actually house all of these features all in one spectral feature. So, um, so in terms of vibrating them, it, it, it will it will be able to actually detect all all the organics, all the biology, as well as the mineralogy. Now, halide is wrong on transparent, so we actually have, have don't have to worry about the backdrop of the mineral here. So whenever we actually get data from you know field samples from Great Salt Lake all, or all around the world, we have a, a, a good idea of that actual biology that's present and the photobiology that's actually occurring due to actual gene adaptation for those photobiological features, those stresses that, that they're adapting to. So with that in mind, zooming in on now what these look like on two different scales, you have the 100 micron scale on the top A and B, and then zoomed into two microns uh, in terms of C and D. And so you have these features that as, 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 as you go through the Z axis, for example, uh, the actual focus of, of all of these fluid inclusions get higher or lower depending on as you're zooming in. And so this is not just one layer of salt crystals in terms of fluid inclusions. These are several layers within the actual mineral matrix. And so to get an idea uh, in terms of how robust this would be in terms of UVC, we've taken the beta carotene from these samples, or at least actually been able to entomb our own salt samples, and, and, and then subject them to UVC. This is what would be on Mars. And so, uh, um, well, I guess before I get into that, um, this shows that uh, in terms of the actual brine itself, on the left here, uh, you have a brine droplet that essentially, as, as you're going counterclockwise, is evaporating. And so you're getting features here um, as the brine is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, crystals are forming on their own, you know, from the, like, from those kinetics. Um, and so so as that's actually happening, you have a higher concentration of these crystals as you're going counterclockwise um, as the brine is evaporating. So the salts are forming. And so on the top right, uh, you have these three black salt crystals that are in this 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 like this small black and white image. And the green that's shown down here corresponds to the Raman wavelengths of beta carotene that we find in Great Salt Lake. Those are all linked together. And so basically the green shows where there's overlap between the salt crystals as well as the beta carotene. So you can see the majority as, as the brines evaporate, the majority of the beta carotene pigments get entombed inside the salt crystals. So you're getting a free preservation metric as, as the brines evaporate. So on Mars, this is ideal, not just in terms of Jezero crater, but the entire planet. So uh, in terms of UVC, or actual protection in terms of UVC, it's not just about preservation, but it's also about understanding how UVC can actually um, be, be fully exposed to these salt crystals and, and the same pigments are able to be uh, preserved. And so on the top right, you have just plain beta carotene that gets burned with UVC. This is 24 hours, one, one Earth day of UVC. Um, and in the middle, you have uh, um, the same concentration of beta carotene, but now inside a fluid inclusion, uh, and that's after 120 hours uh, in terms of UVC. So this is, this is about five and a half Martian weeks of UVC on this one fluid inclusion. And so you can see that, 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 that there is some burning that goes on within the fluid inclusion. But again, you're not just taught, this is one layer of salt in terms of having that pretty thick, you're allowed to, uh, um, uh, or at least in terms of preservation as, as the thickness of the salt as kind of increases, there's a better probability of that not getting burned. Um, and then having this where uh, just the powder itself. Now we found along the way that when you do Raman analyses of these three burned features, they look the same, and so this is in, this is work that's going on now that that's that's actually nearly ready to be written up, or at least almost done being written up. And so the fact that these features um, can be found in these minerals, for example, all across Mars, is, is extremely critical because in terms of the UVC preservation and the Martian dust to actually provide some layer of protection against the UVC, um, it bodes well for 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 actual preservation of these features. And so. Um, the, I guess the previous paper to follow along with this, this is this is in in revision right now, uh, just in terms of seeing the actual diversity of features that are preserved in these salt crystals as well as gypsum, uh, both. The, uh, this is both calcium sulfate as well as sodium chloride. Um, there is a trend between, uh, or at least a difference between the actual diversity if you have halite versus gypsum, and that and that bodes well because. Iron is actually present in, in all of the samples that have gypsum. That, that's the actual greenish dark parts that are here. And so the presence of iron leads to different microbial communities that are preserved inside the gypsum. And that's important because iron on Mars is prevalent. And so 
um, the difference in terms of DNA preservation between samples that have no iron and samples that have iron is, is about six to eight times more, more volumetric DNA inside the gypsum versus the halide. So that bodes very, very well because gypsum uh, is found on Mars. And so again, going back to these features, these are gypsum veins that are found inside Gale Crater alongside gypsum crystals that are found at Great Salt Lake. And that's my finger for scale, but these are a lot smaller. But the point is we know from Mars, they can survive over geologic time. And so I, I'll, I'll end with that, but I wanted just to have folks understand and essentially think about the questions of, now that we're gonna get samples back, where should we look inside Jezero Crater, uh, both within the, work, the, the actual work volume and uh, what we can take back with us to Earth. And so I wanna uh, thank everybody for your time. Um, and I wanna thank my, my research group and then Bonnie, Jamie, and, and all the folks here that, that just put this together. So thank you very much.